first of all, I think some of you I've met before. Uh, if I haven't met you, my name is Kevin Magnabosco. I do work for Rogers Supply Company. Uh, this is my cell number. If you want to write that down. Uh, I do multiple things for Rogers. Uh, one, I am a salesman, so I'm out calling on customers, but I also do technical support for our company. Uh, I let everybody know I will answer my cell phone up till about 8 o'clock at night. Uh, reason why only 8 o'clock, I get up at 4 o'clock every morning. I'm an early bird. So usually by 8.30, I'm in La La Land. I'm sleeping. <laughs> okay? I'm not young anymore. Uh, I also let everybody know I will answer my phone on the weekends if you guys, technicians, are out in the field and got a question or something going on, a piece of Goodman or a man of equipment or dike and mini split. I uh, do let everybody know though, I do ride motorcycles, so if it's a nice day, I might be on my bike. Phone's in the tour pack, I check it every time I stop. Please guys, if you got a question or want to get a hold of me and I don't answer it, leave me a message, a name and number so I can call you back. I don't like calling a number back that hasn't left me a message, just an unknown number. I don't do it. Please, brief message, phone number. Uh, if you want to leave me a brief description of what you, the call's about, that's fine. And as soon as I get available, I will call you guys back all the time. I'm very good about calling people back. Today we're going to talk about furnace and boiler cleaning check. It's going to be kind of remedial stuff, maybe a refresher, you may pick up something. It is what every training organization or sales organization talk about what you should do in a clean and check. Uh, what we believe is a clean and check may or may not necessarily be a clean and check. Now I'll ask everybody a question, how long does it take you to do a clean and check? Anybody? How long does it take you to do a clean check on a furnace? 45 minutes. Anybody else? It's about the going census, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Is that a cleaning check? Honestly? Are you cleaning a furnace in 45 minutes? No. Well, we're saying as a cleaning check, well, if you guys want to take one of these forms, pass it around, is an evaluation check in 45 minutes. We're doing a quick in. We may check the heat exchanger, may check the operation, we may wipe off the furnace, right? Maybe break out a vacuum. Maybe. I'm being honest, guys. Just so everybody knows, I'm just not somebody that gets up in front of a room that has given a presentation and asked to relay information to you guys. You've heard me talk a little bit before we started. I grew up in the business. I've serviced, I've installed. So when I talk, it's from personal experience. You know, whether it be doing it myself or a company I worked for in front of Rogers, I was the installation manager. So I looked at every install, I backed up service guys, and I taught them the right way to do it. And I even give on new techs, I had a proficiency exam, every new service deck had to take before he went out on his own in the shop, and most of them failed. You take 45 minutes, I'm sorry, to find a blown fuse on a furnace. You gotta go, guys. You're not gonna be working for me. <laughs> That's one-on-one -on -one stuff. But anyway, I'm gonna teach you and talk about the proper way to do a cleaning check. Now, when we go and do a furnace cleaning check, quite honestly, everybody has blinders on, right? We're gonna look at that furnace. We don't ever think about, should we check that outdoor unit? Uh, how many guys have ever checked a compressor in the middle of the winter time to check the windings on the compressor before they went and looked at a furnace? Nobody in this room. Probably never even thought of it, right? First thing you always want to do, of course, go to the door, knock on the customer's door, ring the doorbell, let them know that you're here. Uh, I always like telling people, let that homeowner know that when you come out, you check the entire system every time you come out. Now, I know that everybody advertises a very cheap clean and check. Business owners that may be in this room, we have business owners in here? 
Are you guys all pretty much service techs? Business owners hate when I say that cleaning checks should be two to four hours. Especially when you guys are probably going out on a $39 cleaning check on up. That $39 cleaning check is to promote you to get in the door. So by going out and checking the whole system, you have a lot of ability to add on to that ticket. So you knock on the door, let them know you're there, and explain we're checking the entire system. We can run out to the outdoor unit in the middle of winter time, and we can hold out the compressor. Does anybody in the room have a megometer? They'll be in this room. I'll pass this around so you can take a look at this. Very simple tool. We're gonna open up our outdoor unit, pull off our connector to compressor. We're gonna check each winding. Common to start, common to run. Check them to ground. That megometer has lights on it. <clears throat> you do have a number value on there as well, but it, quite honestly, if you go out there with just your meter, <clears throat> the Omada winding, and try to explain that to the customer, they hear blah, 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 blah. You might as well be speaking Chinese because they have no idea what you're saying. That megometer is done with a series of lights. Pretty simple. If it's good, it can be a green light. If it's questionable, it's going to be yellow. If that winding is going to go on that compressor, it's going to show red. Homeowners are visual in audio. Simple. They'll understand green, yellow, red. So you can go out there. Home out the compressor. If you're green, don't worry about it. Button the unit back up, now you can go in the house. If it's yellow, at that point in time, I'd call the customer outside and say, hey, checking out your system, I notice that your compressor windings here are, are getting close to a fail point. Because that is actually measuring the lacquer coating on your windings to ground. It's measuring the resistance. If you're red, that compressor may have been running when they shut it off for the season, but most likely it's not going to start up in the spring. So now, remember, $39 cleaning check, right? We could potentially sell a brand new air conditioner. Now, when you're out there looking at that air conditioner, of course, you're writing down model number, serial number. What if that air conditioner is 17 years old? But, 17 years old, we know we probably got a 17-year-old coil, maybe older, without even going in the house yet, down in the basement. So we write that on our ticket. We have that information. <coughs> now, here's a very important thing once we go in the house. Make sure the system works before we even start, before we start taking it apart. Why would we do that? So that if it doesn't work when we're down there checking it, and they say, well, it worked before you got in here. Exactly right. Homeowners <laughs> misconstrued the fact of a service call and a clean and check, especially if you're advertising a $39 clean and check to get you in the door, where you may charge $96 for a service call. I want a clean and check for $39.95. No one at their system don't work. So that one's cover your own butt. It works before you touched it. Now, shut the system back off, now we go downstairs. How many guys carry electronic leak detectors for checking air conditioners? A lot of people, right? We can check the evaporator coil. Maybe the air conditioner wasn't that old. Maybe the air conditioner was only seven years old. Compressor windings were good. We all know, though, if we got a copper coil that's about seven years old, most likely it might have a leak in it because we had a lot of leaky copper coils years ago. So we take our electronic leak detector. We can stick it in our ductwork. If you got a humidifier there, all the better, right? We can pop that humidifier off. We've got a big hole. We can stick our wand in there. Now, if we have a leak, our leak detector does what? Beep, 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 beep. Gets louder, right? Remember, consumers, visual audio, they'll understand that. You'll want to call your customer down. You guys like when homeowners sit behind you and watch you do what you're doing? A lot of technicians don't like doing it. I always encourage people, come on, pull up a chair. Watch what I'm doing. Doesn't bother me. But 
Now, potential air conditioner, maybe a coil. Now, if we're doing an air conditioner, we may want to change the line set, of course, disconnect. So now we have a $39 cleaning check, we potentially got a sale, right? You guys do service and sales together, or are you just strictly like service installers? Because every company's different. A lot of companies that we deal with are service guys, and they'll also sell at the same time. Or a lot of companies, if you're a service guy, and you find stuff, you're gonna call a salesman in, right? Either way, whatever works for you, you put got a potential sale. All right, already talked about the windings. Now we're gonna pull our furnace apart. When we pull the furnace apart to clean it, we are going to pull the furnace apart. How many guys pull a complete blower assembly out when they do a cleaning check? Not everybody. There's a reason why, and I'll go over that. Inspect all the components, we're gonna go over that, including our venting pipes, what you see, what it means, things like that. Uh, we'll pass that around so you guys know about the mega meter already. Careful pulling stuff apart, it's been sitting a while, you may find critters in there. I just put this one in for laughs. Believe me guys, this isn't a doctored photo, you may find critters living in equipment. Definitely that. Remember I talked about inspecting vent pipes and everything else. Well, if we got an 80% furnace, we're going up a clay or a brick chimney, right? We have Rocky sitting in there. They got in there, fell in there, couldn't get out. Definitely see a lot of that. Both in 80% furnaces and 90 plus furnaces. Uh, that's a 90 plus that made it all the way back to the furnace. Usually back to the furnace you'll get mice because they're smaller. Uh, a lot of bugs, butterflies. I've seen just about everything. I've, on occasion I've had a few birds all the way up to a furnace on a 90 plus, but a lot on an 80 percenter. But usually on the 80 percenter, they're right on top of the inducer. When you fire it up, you hear the beak hitting that. All right, our vent pipe. That's an 80 percent furnace, right? What do we got going on here? A little bit of rust. Got a little bit of rust, got a little bit of water. It's condensing. Uh, most likely that could be that one there could be two things. <clears throat> Maybe we're missing a vent cap. Vent cap blew off from years ago. Maybe that goes right into a masonry chimney that wasn't lined. Uh, regardless, this is condensation coming down our flue pipe and the white is from the moisture going through the galvanizing, it's leaching through the pipe. Same with that one right there. You'll see that a lot where an 80% furnace was put in uh, from an old gravity vent. Gravity vent, guys, we took room air, right? Mm -hmm. Up that chimney to keep it warm. Modern 80% furnace doesn't do that. We're sealed. Our inducer motor on that furnace is only bringing products of combustion in and out of the furnace. Once we get out of that box, natural draft still takes over, but our flue gases are much colder. We can't heat that chimney, so it actually rains inside that chimney. And if it's a brick, it's on the outside of the house, in the winter time, when it gets really cold, it freezes in the mortar, breaks the mortar out, what happens then? Ba boom, we can drop a chimney. Uh, most townships require you, if you're putting an 80% furnace in, to line the chimney. So keep that in mind when you're putting in furnaces that you're responsible to line that chimney as well. Flue liners are cheap. They're not real expensive. Some might be a pain in the butt to pull, but they're cheap. Or you might see something like that when you're looking at your vent pipe. It happens, guys. It's out there. Uh, I've also seen 80% furnaces trying to be vented out with PVC. It does last a little while till it melts. On a 90 plus furnace, we want to check for any horizontal runs in our PVC. Uh, from my experience, I see a lot of a PVC out there that's not supported enough. It starts bellying down. What happens, you'll be having an intermittent problem. It'll work just fine while you're there. As soon as we got a long run cycle and that water fills up, chips on pressure switch. 
Shuts off, eventually drains out, fires back up. So pay attention, all your piping. Make sure we are pitched back to the furnace. Anybody tell me how much it's supposed to be pitched? Quarter inch per 10 foot. Quarter inch per foot. Per foot. Per foot. And it should be strapped how often? Two to three feet. Most manufacturers say up to five. Personally, I go every three. J hooks are cheap, right? If you're using J hook, in most cases, port, nail, or screw. Everybody uses screws now. Uh, but it's it's quick and easy when you're doing it, especially maybe on a repair. Maybe you guys didn't put that furnace in, and you go there and you see a big sag in your PVC. It's easier to do when the, the basement isn't finished. It's easier to do when the basement isn't finished. I agree with you with that 100%. When you're above drywall, you can't see it. But if unfinished basement and you're running along joists, it's easy, especially tack up another J hook, bring it back up to where it needs to be. All right, before we start taking this first part though, we noticed this. What's going on here? We have incomplete combustion, we're rolling out for some reason. One, either maybe a plug heat exchanger or a compromised heat exchanger. So before we start taking it apart, we know we got a possible problem with that cylinder, that tube. While you were running it to make sure it worked before you started, you may have seen this. We're pushing back on one of the burners, on one of the in shots. Right there, possibility, compromised heat exchanger. We should never see that. For some reason, we have air going into that tube. Most likely on a modern furnace, the way the heat exchangers are designed, it's less likely to be plugged. That would probably be a crack. So we pull our blower housing out. That's a picture of a secondary heat exchanger, right? Which is right above your blower housing. So if you're not pulling your blower housing out and inspecting everything, we wouldn't even know if our secondary heat exchanger looked like that. Now, if you've been to any of my other classes on furnace troubleshooting or air conditioning, charging, whatever, we always talk about one thing, airflow. Airflow is our biggest offender in everything. You think we're going to get good airflow with a secondary looking like that? Absolutely not. So that has to be clean. Now, if secondary heat exchanger looks like that, most likely your evaporator coil is going to look like that as well. How many guys carry a flexible wand camera in here? Anybody? How many people carry a smartphone in here? Everybody, right? Yeah. Okay, if you don't want to spend the money for a nice flexible wand camera, go to Amazon. They make one that goes to your smartphone, comes with a two or three foot little wand, has a light on the end, you can get it for about 15 bucks. It's called a selfie stick. <laughs> No, it's not a selfie stick, because selfie stick does this. This actually plugs into your smartphone, converts your smartphone into a digital camera that you can take that wand and stick it up and look at a coil. Easiest way to look at this, guys, pull out the high limit. Just about every furnace made out there. Upflow. Downflow is sometimes a little harder, but an upflow, pull out our high limit, take our little wand, bend it up in there, bam. There's our bottom of our evaporator coil. And these people are going to tell you they change their filter every 30 days. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> All right. So we pull out our blower housing. We looked up in there, right? That's an 80% heat exchanger. Guys, we don't need to go any further. If you're not selling furnaces, you better call your salesman out there right now to give this homeowner price on a new furnace. Legally, guys... You're responsible to lock that furnace out. Disconnect the gas, disconnect the electric. If you leave this furnace operational, who's responsible? You. you are as a tech, not the company you work for. Because you were the last person that touched it and you left that operation. That will kill somebody, you're doing nothing but putting carbon monoxide in the house. So now, that's another heat exchanger. Uh, that's a rooftop unit. 
Now, how do we get things like this? Too much heat. Too much heat, right? Airflow, also manifold gas pressure. And I'll talk a little bit more about manifold gas pressure. Has anybody seen a gas valve increase by not touching it? It, it can do it. How many people put drip legs on their gas lines? Should put on all of them. Without a drip leg, debris can get inside that gas valve. And the way it's made, there's these little veins and ports in there that is pressure activated, and that's what increases or decreases spring pressure inside that gas valve. If they get plugged, it will turn up your manifold pressure higher. And you'll never know it if you don't check it. So airflow and improper manifold pressure will cause that. Heat exchangers are designed to last a long time. Normal operation. That and that is not normal operation, that's misuse. Pull our blower housing out, looks like that. All right. Now as service technicians, if you're out there on a cheap cleaning check, you charge extra for that? You should. That should be an extra. I've had them as just as bad where you had to physically take it to the car wash. You could not clean it. Now be careful guys, because somewhere in all of that, there's a weight. If you knock the weight off, what happens? You got to replace the wheel. So be careful. Don't knock weights off. Uh, usually what happens to them, if it, if you catch it in time, you're fine. If you don't, and we're all plugged up, the wheels implode. Everybody's ever seen them implode? The sides suck in, and then they go up to a point. And you hear, and they take out the housing and everything else. Then you got to replace the whole thing. Check our burners when we pull them out. Okay? Check our crossovers. If you don't know how an in-shop burner works, it uses those crossovers to go to the next burner. Our fire actually comes out of here. Air comes around here. So what's this one doing? It's kind of plugged. That one's not burning too good. Now, eventually, they'll all light, even with crossovers plugged. And when they do, you hear it. Because remember, we go three time trial for ignition. Maybe on that third time, we got enough gas built up across there when it goes. It lights and you use the front door to furnace, you hear boom. You see it suck in sometimes. You see it suck in? I've seen them blow the sight glass out of some furnaces. Pops them out. Personally myself, I like watching stuff light off. Be careful. Especially when we talk about boilers. Ribbon burners, they get rolled over, they will light too. And when it does, it shoots at you. So be very careful if you're like me and you like watching stuff light off. Okay? I don't have to worry about losing hair, but, but heat exchange was fine, right? Put it all back together. We want to light it off. We want to check all of our safety controls. We want to check our high limits, make sure they're working fine. Make sure our flame roll arts are fine. If you have a tripped flame rollout, what's that a sign of, guys, before we even take it apart? Most likely a cracked heat exchanger. Not always though on a 90 plus furnace. If you have a furnace, a condensing furnace with a sealed combustion, we are bringing air from the outside. Now for a two pipe system, we can have a blockage in our intake pipe. Not getting enough oxygen for a flame and the flame is searching for oxygen, so it'll pull back trying to get the oxygen it needs to burn and triple flame roll off. So you may not have a bad heat exchanger. You could have a hornet's nest in there. You could have a hornet's nest. Uh, you could have a squirrel, I ran into a rabbit, squirrel, mud dauber. In there? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, how many guys work on rooftops? Anybody in here? What do you carry in your service bag in the summertime? I know I always did. Hornet wasp spray, because before you even took the panel off it, you're spraying by where your power goes in, your disconnect, kind of squirting in raw your electronics, because that's where they're at all the time. All right, we want to ohm out our igniter. If it is a modern 120 volt silicone igniter, because we still have some 80 volt igniters out there, 120 volt, you should read about 36 to 68 ohms on that igniter. The old 80 volters were 11 to 18 ohms. Carbide igniters, 30 to 60, mm -hmm. if you got a carbide igniter out there. Igniters, do we touch them, guys? Never, right? Hot spots, they glow for a short period of time, then they go and burn out, and you see your fingerprint, right? You touched it <coughs> from your oil. We want to check our inducer motor. First of all, we want to make sure our inducer motor is pulling the proper amps for the rating plate. We want to make sure the inducer motor is pulling the proper pressure for our pressure switch. How many guys have a manometer in here? What type of manometer you guys got? Field piece, this one right here? Yep. Well, no, I only got two boards. There's a reason why I show this one. If you want to write this down, if you, if you need a manometer, it's the field piece SDMN6. And if you notice, I have some other things attached to it. I have a wire, a couple female spades, I got another hose with a Y and a single tube connected to it. This manometer has a built-in vacuum pump. How many guys use universal pressure switches for a service part, 7 OEM? Like this one right here. How do we set it? Oh, this one comes with little orifices that we put in there, springs for tension. But this pressure switch will do from minus 10 to 10 inch. Now, we're supposed to set this pressure switch to what the original pressure switch closes at. How do we know? Some guys suck on their manometer, try to get a reading, try to close this. With that manometer, with a vet, with a vacuum pump in it, put it to your test mode, turn it up to what the old pressure switch is. You're going to plug your two wires onto your pressure switch, your hose onto your port, and then you take your little Allen wrench to set it, and it gets to where your vacuum pump pressure is set at, the light comes on. Now it's set to the proper pressure. What might be the case of why the pressure switch isn't closing? Blocking the flu. We might have a block in our flu pipe on a 90 plus. We may have a crack in the heat exchanger we didn't see. We may have a partially plugged secondary heat exchanger. And the reason why the pressure switch wasn't making, it was doing its job as a safety device. So if you don't have a manometer and you need to buy one, buy that one. Also, every time we do an install, we're supposed to set manifold pressure, right? I already talked about checking manifold pressure on a cleaning check. How do we hook to a White Rogers gas valve? We need an adapter to go over that port, right? Honeywell gas valves are different, right? We need a fitting to go into the gas valve. And you also heard me talk about airflow and a complete other class, static pressure. Lo and behold, that manometer comes with all that stuff you need. Two White Rogers adapters, two Honeywell adapters, two static pressure tips. This little adapter is for other uh, Pressure switch is out there. Comes with a bunch of hose and a nice little carrying box. Bad. So if you add up everything, a manometer, 
static pressure tips, bunch of hose, you are way more than $275 at that cost. And you got everything contained. Okay? I have Magna Helix too. If I'm on a rooftop, I use Magna Helix for one reason. Magna Helix won't freeze. Digital screens could freeze if it's really cold. So when I was out working on rooftops, I always carried my Magna Helix, but I carry three to do everything that I need. Static pressure, you need a one inch zero center. You need a five inch for doing manifold pressure. You need a 15 for doing inlet pressure. You gotta carry multiples. Now you got a big case, and they're 80 bucks a piece. Okay, you do the math. Static pressure tips, 46 bucks. Oh, yeah. It all adds up. <clears throat> so when we do our gas pressure, we also want to also monitor our inlet at the same time. Inlet pressure, we always set to have a minimum. Manufacturers say four and a half. I prefer five for one reason. Three and a half inch manifold pressure on a normal natural gas furnace. Every gas valve made has a one inch differential built into it. We're at three and a half out, and we get to four and a half in. What happens, guys? Pressure switch will close. I mean, gas valve closes. We don't have that one inch differential. With that one, you can monitor inlet and manifold at the same time. It'll read separately P1, P2. So you can use it to monitor two hoses, one on inlet, one on manifold. Check our blower motor. Compare it to the rating of the motor. Make sure we're running at proper amps. After we get done, we're also checking our temperature rise. That's a normal. Everybody in classes I've done, always raise your hand. I always check temperature rise. Check your flame signal. Everybody checks the flame signal, right? Flame sensor. What about old thermal couple? Do you guys check them? Do you clean a thermal couple? No? How much does a thermal couple cost? Average, six bucks. Are we gonna go through the hassle of trying to clean a thermal couple? Some flame rods are more money. I, I can see possibly cleaning them. Uh, no plumber's cloth. No sanding uh, for brazing, your sanding cloth. Scotch Brite pad, fine steel wool, emery cloth. What if you don't have any of those with you? What's a good cleaning thing to clean a pressure switch? Hopefully everybody in, their, in here has got it in their pocket. Good old dollar bill works just fine. Clean a flame rod. Uh, they also I've seen floating around. I'm going to see if I can bring them in. They make a little keychain. It's about this long. That you just take and it's got little fine wires in there to clean it. Uh, if you use a, a file, a knife, uh, heavy sandpaper, gritty sandpaper, what you're doing, first of all, is you're causing grooves in there. And what it does is it takes that flame and scatters it around so you don't read a proper signal. And also with sandpaper, you're taking that grit and it stays on there <coughs> and it burns on there. You know, you coat it with that and now it won't sense at all. Our biggest offender is 80% equipment because usually when you go do a clean check on the 80% furnace, where's the litter box? right next to the furnace. Mm -hmm. Always, homeowners love putting it there. It's in their laundry room. It's the worst thing for a furnace. Try to encourage them to move it. But flame rod, you want to be between one and four. The higher, the better. Once you get below one, it starts becoming weak. Also, when we're checking that, make sure we have a good ground on everything. Make sure our burner grounds are attached. Make sure our main ground if it's there, when the furnace is wired up, is attached. I've had furnaces work fine for years. Then one day they won't sense flame. No ground wire. But for years it actually used the conduit to ground itself. But it is not a true ground. And out here you guys use Romex and BX, flexible. That's got a separate ground in there. Usually I see guys do this, they got their white and black, they take that silver one, throw it out of the way, it's in the way, they never hook it up. Don't rely on BX, even conduit, to be a good ground. 
Also, you want to check condensate pump if you have a condensate pump, even for an air conditioner, if it's an 80% furnace, make sure that that is working. Make sure the drain is clear. Remember, we're checking the entire system the entire time. How long does it take to check the condensate pump? If you've got a laundry sink right by your furnace, grab a cup of water, pour it in there. It's usually going to dump in the laundry sink if they have no floor drain, so shh. Okay, it's working. <clears throat> furnace should look like the day it was installed after you get done, right? Maybe. Some you can't, but try to get as clean as possible. Uh, wipe all the dust out. I know guys that wax furnaces, guys. They carry spray detailer. Make it nice and shiny. <clears throat> Looking at your flame when it's burning, more so on an old ribbon style, you can see them better. If you got yellow, not good. You gotta adjust your air curtain. You could have yellow tips on LP though. That is normal. Natural gas better be blue. Anybody see orange speckles in there? Don't worry about orange. That's dirt. As long as the flame's not completely orange, but if it's burning, you'll see orange here and there. That's just dirt being sucked in through the flame. Boilers. Minimally, we want to take off our vent pipe and look inside down a boiler. What do we got going on here? We're all suited up, right? That boiler going to work good? No. Of course, we want to pull our burners out, pull out our uh, pilot assembly. Got to make sure that's all clean. Anybody ever have to kind of clean a boiler that looked like that before? You're going to get yourself one of these, first of all. After you pull the entire jacket off so you can get in there. And keep scrubbing and scrubbing. They do make a saw. That's a long saw blade that's not real sharp. It's got like teeth on it that you can get it down in there and saw that stuff. You better be running a big shop back when you're doing that. Because it's probably never going to fail when you get a boiler like that. Homeowner's going to have white carpet in their house. <laughs> What's going to happen? You're going to be replacing carpet, maybe furniture. But make sure we clean that block very good. Should look like that. Our fire is between here coming up, your little lens get heated up and turn that heats up our entire cast iron block, water's flowing through, we heat our water. Check all of our near piping. That's an auto vent. It's venting a little too good. It's venting water, not air. Okay? There's an add-on sale. That should not look like that. We have to replace that vent. Those you can replace on the fly, no problem. Spin them out, spin a new one in. Pile assemblies, here again, we pull it out and clean it. Make sure it looks brand spanking new before we put it back in. Steam boilers. How many guys in here work on steam? We talked a little before everybody got here. Steam is few and far between. But there's still steam boilers out there. Biggest thing on a steam boiler, you want to make sure you clean the side glass. Anybody ever pull one out to clean it? Be careful. That particular one there, you might have problems with pulling it out. But that sight glass on a steam boiler tells you visually how much water's in the boiler. Steam boilers, if you don't work on them or haven't worked on them, they're completely different than a water boiler. Water boils a sealed, water boiler is a sealed system. Steam, we always have to put water in. Very critical that our low water cutoff and our feeder are working correctly. This, you'd have to pull these little rods out, loosen up these nuts. Don't be afraid if you break it, you're gonna call us up, I need a site class for a boiler. Counter guys are gonna ask you, do you need a cut or two? If you've never worked on steam boilers, you need a cutter. Sight glasses are different sizes. They're not all the same. So you're going to get your sight glass, you're going to get your cutter. 
There's two types. One's a chain, goes on the outside. The other one goes inside, scores the inside of the sight glass. You take and pull your little handle down, and it should snap off clean. I guarantee the first couple you do, you're going to break them, you're going to come back to us and get another one. It happens, okay? Be careful. You're also going to get two new seals. So once we do get our sight glass to the right length, we put our locking nuts on there, put our new seals on there, set it into place, tighten them down, we're good to go. Fill it back up with water. And it should look similar to that. Okay, We can see the water in the boiler. See our water line right here. This here, our low water cutoff, and a dump valve here. Years ago, everybody told homeowners, we need, you need to skim off your boiler at least once a week. Skim off on a steam boiler means take your valve, open it till the boiler shuts off, or some people drain them all away. By doing that, you're adding extra oxygen into that, and steam boilers don't like it. You will greatly reduce the life of a steam boiler by doing that. Ideally, if you're doing a cleaning check for the first time of the season for the homeowner, after you clean your block, clean your burners, put everything back in order, we're gonna fire it up. While the boiler's running, you wanna take your dump valve, your skim valve, lift it up. Because that's piped in right to a drain till that boiler shuts off. You're gonna shut your valve, then you're gonna listen and watch, because you'll see that sight glass fill back up with water. That lets you know that your low water cutoff is working properly, and your water feeder valve is working properly to refill that boiler. Never ever adjust the pressure on a steam boiler to try to get more steam. Residential steam boilers are set at 0.5 PSI. I have seen steam boilers that have been turned up to 5 PSI. You will blow a steam boiler up at that kind of pressure. So be very careful. Steam processing boilers or high pressure steam boilers work at 5 PSI and above. High pressure steam will cut you if you break a line while it's running. It's that much pressure, so be careful. Never ever turn them up. Go around and check all your radiator vents. While the boiler's operating, you should hear them go because it builds up pressure, releases. Builds up pressure, releases. Uh, if you take that steam vent out, that radiator there will get very hot. The rest of them won't. So, so I want to cover with steam. I give a little bit, guys, with steam boilers. Maintenance-wise, though, like I said, easier than a water boiler. There's not a lot to a steam boiler. Back to water boilers, we want to check our pumps. Uh, if we have a Series 100 pump still on the system, that's an oilable pump. Uh, I have an oil cap right here for our bearing, and we have a little oil plug here for our motor itself. A couple drops, guys. That's all you need to put in there. That tube that you guys buy from us will almost last a lifetime for a Series 100 pump. You use more when you first put it in because it's dry. There's little lines on there that tells you how much to use at what part of the pump. After that, if you had a replacement tube, it'll last forever. A couple drops, beginning of the season. Series 100 pumps are getting kind of passe. Uh, Velo pumps, Grunfoss pumps, all your other Tanko pumps out there. Cartridge pumps, for one, you don't have to oil them. They will last longer. They actually have a better performance than a Series 100 pump. They'll actually push water a lot higher than that pump will. But years ago, that's what was out there. So people just got used to, if they got a Series 100 pump, every year they put a couple drops of oil in. Check our expansion tanks. You'll still see expansion tanks like this up in the ceiling. They're still out there, big steel tanks. Uh, modern tank, 
be usually mounted on an air scoop with an auto vent right on there. Any tank though, it's an expansion tank. Water gets hot, it's going to expand. We need a place for it to expand. Whole purpose of the tank. You can tell if the expansion tank's working or not by tapping on it. Solid sound, dead sound. Air gap. If it's completely solid, here, here, tank's bad. Same thing with here. Solid, solid sound, tank's bad. It's full of water. Old timers on some of the old tanks, like that gray one, didn't really have a bladder in it, but the way it was made, you'd have to crack a union open, and it would suck air up in there, and then the water would just have like an air cushion inside that tank. Uh, the old timers with them type of boilers knew how to do that themselves, and you normally would know that because on the drain valve, they had a garden hose hooked to it to their drain. So when it got too full or their pressure relief kept opening up, they'd go there, drain their tank, shut it off, usually it was a secondary valve that they can open up, it would suck the air in and they'd be ready to go. These guys, if they're bad, you can change them on the fly if you want to get a little wet. Typically, when I ever put one in new, I put a valve in here. That way, if I ever had a bad tank, shut my valve off, spin it off, spin my new one on, open my valve back up, I'm done. Keep in mind, every time we take a boiler system down, if we drain it down, we have to bleed the air out of this system. There are a lot of systems out there that didn't have bleeder valves put in, didn't have valves to bleed it. <laughs> Anybody seen an old wall radiant, ceiling radiant system with copper tube? A lot in Chicago, and the manifolds were up in a closet somewhere. Now, these are going back 30, 40 years. So what do you think those shutoff valves and balancing valves after 40 years look like? They're rusted. They're rusted. So many people have had screwdrivers on them. You can't move them. So. The least amount of time you got to take a boiler down and drain it, the better. If you do have to change one of these that doesn't have a shutoff valve in here, here's what I recommend. Get your new tank. Be nice to the next guy. Get a shutoff valve. Get it ready to go, ready to spin up in there. Loosen that one up. Get to about a turn left to go. Every water boiler has a drain valve in it. If you open that drain valve, you cut pressure in the system. You can spin that off, spin the new one on, close your drain valve in a matter of no time flat, and you won't get soaking wet. You may get a little bit on your pant legs, or maybe a little bit on your shirt, but you're not drenched. So keep that in mind. Here again, modern setup here. We always have an air scoop in there and an auto vent. Anybody know how an air scoop works? Everybody, everybody seen the inside of an air scoop for a boiler? It's got little fingers in there. So as the water goes through, the little fingers take the little droplet of air, catches it. Goes up in here, our little auto vent, lets the air out. Even though a water boil boiler is a sealed system, you will still have to add water to it periodically. We're heating water up, it's cooling down. We're expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting. We do have natural evaporation going on in a water boiler. We always have to add more water, but it's minimal. With that in mind, you'll never have a problem because that minimal amount of air that's introduced to the system as it goes around it's automatically taken out. Now if you fire that system up and you hit the pumps on you gurgle, 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 you got water, you got air in there. Start bleeding. Check our operation, bring our boiler up to operating temperature and make sure that our aquastat shuts our boiler off at the proper temperature. Typically nowadays it can be about 180. Uh, 
On some of your radiators, you can run it a little bit hotter, but if you got baseboard, it's going to be about 180. 12 to 15 PSI, operating pressure. Uh, one thing, don't ever check to see if a temperature pressure relief works or not on a boiler. If it's not leaking, leave it alone. Because if you open it, most likely it will leak after you touch it. Now you got to take the boiler down, replace the temperature pressure relief, put a new one in. If the relief opens, there's a reason. Most likely the tank's bad and we're building too much pressure up. Or somebody tried to adjust a pressure reducing valve for your inlet water and turn it up past 12 PSI. Because they are factory set at 12. <coughs> Already talked about bleeding. Make sure all of our radiators and baseboard heat. Uh, baseboard, you should have a bleeder on one side of your baseboard. What if you don't and you got air in it? What do you do? You got to get past that one first. You got an airlock baseboard, you're not getting past that one. Here's what I see, you guys. Maybe, maybe not. I used to carry uh, self piercing bells with me. Copperfin baseboard has a cover on it, right? Proper way to do it is with a vent 90, because you normally come up to the basement, through the baseboard. You may go to another one, but then you go back down. So you need a place to vent it. So you have a vent tee or vent 90. But if you don't have that, little saddle valve, self-piercing, find it on there, leave it out. Once we get the air out, shut it down, put our cover back on. The next time, you know you can do it. Old timers with radiators, they knew every season, because they were told 30 years ago, take this key and this bucket and go to every radiator and open up that valve until you got nothing but water out of there. So you're gonna find a key and a bucket usually right by the boiler and it's usually right next to their little tube of oil and every season they went around bled each radiator. They did it on their own. So if you don't have a key, most likely there's one in the house. We also want to check all of our zone valves and or pumps. Every house is different. You may zone with pumps, you may zone with valves. Uh, you might have some type of zone valve control or pump control on the wall. Personally, when I do installs, I like a nice clean install. I've got a control on the wall, stat, 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 control, valve, 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 or pump, pump, pump. My zone board tells me which zone is calling, that turns your boiler on, yada, yada, yada. It's just a clean install. Adds a little bit to a job, but looks a lot nicer. Uh, here again, just make sure everything works. Listen, make sure we have no air left in the system. There's our coin key vents and our key. So it doesn't matter. Years ago, you had to have, you got a key and a coin key key actually fits around there. The keys are still made the same way. And you know what that little hole in that key was for? Originally? That key's been unchanged for years. That, that little hole was so they could take a shoelace, tie it on there, and they hung it by the boiler. That's your old timers. That's how you'll see them. That or a metal coat hanger. Took an old coat hanger, they bent it up, they hang it on a nail, and there it sits right by the board. That's all I had. Wow. We got some time, didn't we? All right. Doing this presentation for U.S. Service Tax teaches you what to look for because I know if you're not a business owner, your boss needs to make money. Is he making money at $39.95 for a cleaning check? Mm -hmm. When do you start making money on a cleaning check? Does anybody know? As a business owner. When it leads to a change up? 
it's got to be over a hundred bucks just to break even. So, and I know everybody, I don't care where you're at, down here in Champaign Urbana, or up in Chicago by me, everybody advertises cheap cleaning checks, thirty-nine dollars on up. I've seen some as low as twenty-nine dollars. That gets you in the door. All you're doing for that is ringing the doorbell. But your owners, if you're not a business owner in your tech, expect you to sell something. So do a clean and check right. Make your company money, make you money. So everybody's happy. Homeowners may or may not be happy. But if you're doing it right and you pull the whole thing apart, they can see the value in it. Especially when you bring them there, hey, look at this. You might be the first person to ever pull that furnace apart. That furnace might be 15 years old. But every year they've had their furnace clean and check. And it's been somebody that wiped a magic wand on it. They were upstairs, never talked to them. They didn't want to be bothered. And they did down in the basement, hitting the side of the furnace, running a vacuum cleaner. You know, did absolutely nothing. So now you go there, holy cow, look at this furnace. You take it all apart. It's a disaster. That might turn into a sale. Replace it. It might be beyond cleaning. Right? Half of cleaning checks are for customer rapport anyway. They are. Now, granted, to maintain a factory warranty, manufacturers tell you must be maintained on an annual basis, right? Do you got to pull a furnace completely apart that's two years old? No, not likely. You might, depending on the house, typically the first couple of years, it is a dog and pony show for a poor. You're really not doing anything because that furnace isn't dirty. That's a complete different story. That is your 45 minute clean check. But anything with age on it, it's not 45 minutes, guys. All right, so we're gonna check our condensers. Check our compressor windings, right? And check our evaporator coils. We're gonna pull the equipment apart, dismantle it, look inside, look for any possible problems with it. And that can either be a fix or replace, because there is that point where a repair outweighs the replacement of a furnace. If it's too much to repair it, then you have to replace it. What's that? Cost effectively. Cost effectively. Any other questions? So they get you out of here, and you can probably still make the Cubs game. <laughs> <laughs>